Amazing. Well, I want to welcome you to this year's Unreached Conference. We are um, focusing on this idea of uh, peace building reconciliation, which I'll come on to in due course. But just really to remind you or let you know who we are and what we're trying to do in this gathering. Uh, the Unreached Network, we, we're serving across the New Frontiers family and around the world, really trying to help people think about cross-cultural mission. They're not thinking about it to try and get them thinking about it. If they are thinking about it, just to try and uh, engage people, introduce people to each other, get people thinking about best practice in sending, in cross-cultural church planting. Uh, there's a Turkish proverb, and it's great to have uh, loads from Turkey with us this evening and tomorrow. Let us add a little bit of flavor to your soup. So the idea is you've got your soup, and hopefully we can just add some, some flavor to that just to help you on your way in what God's called you to do. Part of that is opening spaces to kind of have these conversations about mission. And uh, this conference once a year, we try and do that. And one of the things that uh, we're finding is that it's a bit like you've got the New Frontiers story, which is well-defined 40 years in as a New Frontiers family. We know who we are and where we're going and what God's called us to do and what our kind of narrative is. But then there's also the, the global mission story and the conversations and the study and the books that are written and the things that are happening in that space, which has it got its own sort of narrative. And we're trying to see those two join. So we feel at times like we're standing on a juncture between, if you like, two great rivers. There's a place in Brazil called Manaus. And if you stand there, you can have the Solimos part of the Amazon River, which is caramel colored coming from this side. And then on the other side, the the Negro part of the Amazon River, which is black colored water. And they, they're different speeds and different temperatures. So they're different colors. And when they combine, they run next to each other for about six kilometers before they finally sort of become the great Amazon. And um, in a sense, we feel like we stand at the juncture between these two narratives, kind of the New Frontiers story, and then a lot of the work around best practice and thinking that happens in the global missions space. And just trying to see these two add energy to each other, add strength to each other, so that hopefully the mission narrative strengthens what we're doing in New Frontiers, and maybe even the other way as well. And the, the aspect that we're focusing on today and tomorrow is this aspect of peace building or reconciliation. And um, uh, we've got Owen Hilton with us, who will be speaking tomorrow, uh, very much about a UK context. Uh, we've got Noah who will be joining us tomorrow afternoon, very much from a sort of Middle Eastern context. Um, and I think both of these guys are guys that are, are doing this in their ministry. So it's the nitty gritty of pastoral work of actually seeing people from different backgrounds with different stories, different narratives, seeing them kind of joined together in Christ. Um, we're going to have case studies uh, from three different uh, places, all of which you might know as places of uh, hotspot or tension. Uh, so Cyprus. Uh, Armenia and South Sudan. So we're going to hear from those three places tomorrow in terms of um, what God is doing and what people are learning in the practical hands-on peace building uh, things. Uh, but also we're going to have a lot of the things that we would normally want to have at a gathering like this. So some news and prayer for different parts of the world, uh, some stories of church planting among unreached people and hearing about new church planting opportunities from across the New Frontiers family and around the world, uh, and some more detailed equipping seminars on various aspects of mission. Uh, and then also lots of times of sort of connection, getting into small groups, networking reflection. I know it's hard, particularly for those who are in the UK, it's really sunny outside and we're sitting in, in a room looking at a screen. Um, but, you know, I'm sure God can bless you despite that and it's the people that are showing the sunshine outside their windows and making other people jealous that's the issue here um and then we're also we're, we're going to do an offering uh, over this time towards the work of this network money that will go into uh, kind of practically helping church planting in unreached spaces and that offering is kind of open all weekend so there are giving details that you'll see uh, go up on slides and stuff and you can basically, you can give at any point during the weekend to what's happening there. But now, that's our kind of introduction. I'd like to offer some thoughts from scripture as an introduction to this subject of mission and peace building. Uh, 
and we're going to be looking at John chapter four. So if you've got your Bible, um, maybe you want to just look at John chapter four. It's a really well-known story, the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. And we're not going to do the whole story, but I just want to pull out some few things that I think will help us frame this conversation uh, with a focus on Jesus and also mission. So Jesus travels up into Samaria, the place that Jewish boys weren't really supposed to travel to, the place that your mum always warned you about. You know, whatever you do, don't go to Samaria. And if you go there, definitely don't talk to any Samaritans. And so but Jesus's mission is always to go to the places that you're not supposed to go to, to go to the people that you're not supposed to go to. And so Jesus is into Samaria. And we read in John chapter four and verse six. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And so the first thing we notice, and we're just going to pull a few things out of this story. But the first thing we notice is you've got a man and a woman and a, sitting by a well. And for those that are familiar with their Old Testament, this is a, a quite a familiar type scene throughout the Old Testament of when a young man is searching for a bride. Often in the Old Testament, they meet at a well. And so um, Abraham's servant finds Rebecca for Isaac at a well. Jacob meets the love of his life, Rachel, at a well. Moses, when he's fleeing from Egypt, meets Zipporah at a well. And so there's something about this kind of uh, what they would call a betrothal scene that carries all the way through scripture, where you've got a, a young man and a young woman. They meet at a well. And some of the elements in that story are often a man travels to a foreign land. He meets a girl at a well. One of them draws water. She goes home to tell her family about the stranger with great joy. And there's a meal. And those are often the ingredients of this betrothal type scene. And so John has deliberately crafted this scene and put it in that verse to look like this, because John is trying to tell us something. He's saying Jesus has come to the world, to a distant land, searching for his bride. And obviously, we understand that metaphorically, spiritually, the bride being the bride of Christ. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus is called the bridegroom. So he's searching for his brides. That's part of the mission of Jesus. But here we see she is to include all nations, even the Samaritans, even this people with this kind of history that is so different from the history of the Jewish people. And he meets this woman and she's not named in the story. She's just called repeatedly in the story, the Samaritan woman. Her ethnicity, her background and her gender are emphasized because those are the things that are the difference between her and Jesus. And those are the aspects of pain in her life. And so if, if you like, she's symbolic, she's representative of the Samaritan community. And we're going to see how Jesus woos her to himself. So verse nine, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? The Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And so the first thing that she says, the first thing that comes out of her mouth is about the inequality in the world and in her life. The first thing she says is, I don't understand how you, a Jewish man, want a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. It's, it's right there in her life. It's right there affecting her every day for her issues of race and her community's story, but also the fact that she's a woman and he's a man. It's right there, and it, and she wants to talk about it. And um, as you would well know, you can't preach to a hungry person until they've had something to eat, right? You give them food, and then you can talk to them. Uh, but in the same way, you can't preach to someone cross-culturally without engaging with their context, their story, their historic pain. It's right there for, for so many people, and particularly in cross-cultural engagements. It's the first thing people notice. It's the first thing people think about. Is It's right there in terms of pain and an understanding of how we got here, 
who we are, why the world is broken. And so she, she wants to talk about it straight away. And Jesus is going to preach to her. He's going to reveal himself to her as the God of Israel. He's going to reveal himself to her as savior of the world. Uh, but he's going to do it by engaging with her question. All the way through John, you see Jesus having dialogues with different individuals, and it's different every time. He doesn't have a packaged gospel presentation that he gives to everybody. He talks to Nicodemus differently. He talks to Samaritan woman differently. He talks to the blind guy in chapter nine differently. He talks to Pilate differently. He's engaging with their questions. It's a dialogue, not a monologue. Christians are great at monologue. Uh, that's what I'm doing right now. You're listening and I'm talking, right? But um, Christian mission should be much more about dialogue, listening to people, scratching where they're itching, making sure that the gospel, which will get presented, meets the questions that they're asking. And this woman's question is about inequality and pain and brokenness in the world. And, and so she talks about some of these binaries, male, female, us, them, Jew, Samaritan, straight away. She, the woman is going to speak seven times in the story. We won't look at all of them, but John is a poet, as you are aware. He's not just kind of relating. He had decades to think about writing his gospel. Matthew, Mark and Luke were done early. John's much later. He's been thinking about it for a long time. He crafts it really well. One of the things he does is he loves the number seven. And so many of the people in the gospel of John speak seven times. And this woman is going to speak seven times, seven being the perfect number. And she's going to go on a journey from uh, initially complaining about him as a Jewish man to, to the end, asking the question, is this the Christ? Is this the Messiah? And so she's going to speak seven times and go on a journey. It's a discipleship journey. Jesus is going to disciple her through dialogue in her understanding of him. And this discipleship journey is something that we're all on. We don't get it all at, at one go. We're all somewhere between one and seven in our understanding of who Jesus is. We're all in via. We're all on a journey of understanding and engaging with someone from a different background can so often enrich our understanding you know listening to people from other nations engaging with conversation with people from other parts of the world can deliver us from our blind spots and our sacred cows and enlarge and enrich our perspective on Christ and so this cross-cultural conversation is a massive part of dialogue and hopefully what we're going to be doing over the next couple of days as we hear from different people in different parts of the world verse 16 Jesus said to her, so we're skipping a few verses. We're just pulling a few things out. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. So we just there's a traditional kind of reading of the Samaritan woman as kind of sexually immoral, and she's had lots of guys. And we just need to blow that right out of the water. Often that's because those commentaries were written by kind of white men who lived in an ivory tower somewhere and didn't really engage with people with mess and pain in their lives. But obviously, if Jesus is talking about her actual sexual history, her actual marriage story, please don't think she's an immoral woman. Culturally, and reading the Bible is always a cross-cultural exercise, right? Um, much older men married much younger women. Often those older men died because the, the mortality rate was really high. And so that's why there were so many widows in community. And that's why the Bible talks so much about looking after widows. And so at the very least, if she's been married five times, it could be because she's been widowed a bunch of times, not her fault. Or if she's been divorced, Remember, divorce was always at the male prerogative. Culturally, women could not initiate a divorce. So if she's been divorced a bunch of times, it's not her fault. So either way, it, this history, and if she's married, if she's living with someone now who she's not married to, then even in that scenario, that's not on her, it's on him, right? Because it couldn't be her initiative culturally. It would have to be his. So we can't judge her if Jesus is talking about her sexual history. But more compelling... And I think it's relevant to what we want to talk about this weekend is I think Jesus isn't talking about her marital history at all. I think he's talking delicately, discreetly and indirectly about Samaria's story. I think he's talking about the colonial, colonial history of Samaria. 
you see the woman's not named. It's not really about her individual story. It's about her as a representative of her community. And the history is important. Jesus isn't talking to her as a decontextualized individual. She's a Samaritan. She's someone embedded in a community and a history, a very familiar history. Memory is important. You know, if it, it, often if an American says to someone that's history, what they mean is it's not important. But in many parts of the world, if you say that's history, what you mean is that's really important. That's who we are. And this woman is backwards focused. She's always talking about our father. Are you better than our ancestors? Our father Jacob gave us this world. And that was thousands of years ago. So she's living in a backwards focused story that defines who she is and who her community are. And a lot of people in the world think that way. Think about time as facing backwards into our history, whereas often Westerners think about time as facing forwards towards the future. But many communities are much more history and tradition oriented. And Jesus could well here be referencing the colonial history of Samaria. You see, Samaria had been colonized five times by different powers, the first being Assyria 700 years previously. And Assyria had come, they'd taken people forcibly from that bit of the country and deported them to other parts of the world. An imperial strategy still today that people do forcibly remove, remove you from the land and put you somewhere dislocated. And then they brought in a whole load of other people. And so you've ended up with this community that's really mixed and isn't deeply embedded in the land. And that is why Jews didn't really trust Samaritans. And, and so, but that's happened five times during the history. And if you like now, the, the six, the one that isn't quite the husband, you know, she's like, that's not my husband, um, could be talking about the Romans who are there at the moment and the Roman experience of empire. And so I wonder if Jesus is talking about the history of oppression of Samaria. I wonder if he's engaging in conversation that she's initiated, talking about injustice and pain. But I wonder if he's doing it indirectly and discreetly so as not to shame her. It's super important in a post-colonial world to be aware of history and the pain that comes from it. And much of our world today is post-colonial and many communities carry intergenerational trauma. And in fact, and I think this is really important, the 20th century was one of the most violent centuries we've witnessed. Genocides, world wars, atrocities. And so what was sown in the 20th is reaped in the 21st. And intergenerational trauma that carries through families and through dislocated communities, studies tell us that often that takes three generations to, to even get talked about. So the first generation, so in the history of Holocaust survivors, in the history of partition out of India and Pakistan, first generation just didn't talk about the atrocities that they saw, what they experienced. Second generation ignored it completely, threw themselves into other things, work, trying to reestablish life. And it's only really the third generation who've wanted to talk about it and interrogate what happened and address things. And so we're going to see that happen. I just think about some of the pain and mess that's in the world right now. Whether it's Russia and Ukraine, or Sudan, Yemen, Syria, we're only going to see the, the need for healing and conversations coming out of that. If it's true in the third generation, that's way down the line. And that's going to massively impact Christian mission in this century. And so I firmly believe Jesus is giving us an example here of how to relate cross-culturally in a situation of, um, of massive injustice and pain that's been caused to this community that's 700 years old. And this woman wants to talk about it. And Jesus is engaging with it. Then the woman says to him in response, verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And to be prophetic is to engage with injustice and to care about what's broken in the world. I, I don't think she's saying you're a prophet because you have a word of knowledge about my sexual history. I think she's saying you're a prophet because you seem to care about the things that God cares about. You seem to care about my community's story and history, and you want to talk about it uh, with wisdom and sensitivity and empathy. And friends, to be a prophetic community, we've got to talk about things. You know, I, I love the title of Ben Lindsay's book, We Need to Talk About Race. You know, it's it's provocative book, provocative title. 
It's saying we've got to talk about it. And um, silence is a great strategy for maintaining the status quo. If you want nothing to change, say nothing, do nothing. Nothing will change. Uh, but if you're not happy with the way things are, then you need to speak. I was reading yesterday uh, some reflections on the life of um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu uh, from South Africa. I think Angela Kemp's on the call. She probably knew him. She was probably best mates with him. So, um, but there's this idea of po you know kind of post apartheid Desmond Tutu leading the Healing and Reconciliation Committee Commission as kind of uh, cuddly and lovely and like everybody's best friend uh, but actually before that when he was fighting tooth and nail against injustice he wasn't cuddly at all he was prophetic and strong and un unpopular and ungainly and sometimes there's what they call the santa claus of santa clausification of of resistance characters but there is a prophetic thing that is hard-nosed and that does care about injustice and um that is what it means to be a prophetic community. Uh, verse 20, just a couple more things. You get this uh, famous conversation, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And so she's saying, but look, my, my community's story says that we should worship on this mountain in Samaria, and we've had our own sort of rival temple there. You can you, They get there in the Old Testament. You can see it. But you're saying your community's story says that we have to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And so we've got this binary, you know, you can't worship on two mountains. So who's right and who's wrong? It, and it's very binary, this, this discussion. It's like either our mountain or your mountain. Either you're right or we're right. It can't be both. So Jesus, which one is it? And Jesus says to her famously, know that the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But the hour is coming and is now here. Jesus has ushered in this new period of history, this new phenomenon, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. So Jesus breaks the binary. Uh, wisdom always creates a new option. So often things in culture, you know, what you might call culture wars, so often come down to a binary. And it's either us or them. It's insiders or outsiders. It's right or wrong. You, you're either in this community or in that community. And Jesus so often in his glorious wisdom refuses to be pigeonholed onto one side of the debate or the other, but he creates a new option. And wisdom so often does that. It creates a new alternative. It has the imagination to come up with something different. So he says, no, it's not that mountain or that mountain, but the father is seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit. And Jesus has brought in a new time in history you know, the big difference between the old covenant and the new covenant is the old covenant was centered, specifically centered on a particular ethnicity, a particular place, a particular way of worshiping, a sacred language. But the new covenant of Jesus talked about here and broken in through the cross and demonstrated powerfully at Pentecost in the outpouring of the spirit is that now there isn't a holy mountain. There isn't a holy ethnicity. There isn't a holy language. Christianity does not have a center, the spirits poured out at Pentecost and all languages are celebrated. And the lovely verse in the Pentecost story is um, that each of us hears the wonders of God in his own kind of vernacular village tongue. If you want to drill into the translation like that. The, and, and so there's no sacred language. There's no sacred ethnicity and Christianity has no center. It's not centered in Jerusalem. It's not centered in the Vatican. It's not centered in uh, Bethel, Reading, California, you know, there isn't a center where we go on pilgrimage and where we encounter God. And because there's no center, there is uh, Christianity gets to be polycentric, multicentric. It gets to be spread around the world. Pentecost renders all vernaculars equidistant from Jerusalem, said Lamin Sane, the great West African scholar. And this is what Jesus is ushering in. And he uses family language. He says the father is seeking worshippers who will worship him in spirit and truth. And as soon as he's talking about God as father, he's appealing to common humanity. He's calling this woman sister. 
And he's saying, you know, if it's a man, you say you were my brother from another mother. And if it's a woman, you say you are a sister to me from another history. And though it's a mystery, yet it means this to me. Yeah, it's bliss to me. Come on, give another holy kiss to me. And he wouldn't quite have gone there, Jesus, because that might have been culturally inappropriate. But this idea of an embrace, a holy kiss between people uh, from different backgrounds when you only kiss family is, is appealing to the fact that in Christ we're family. And he's appealing here to father. And then verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, I am. And this is one where in our English translation, uh, we lose it a little bit. But what he says to her in Greek, the way John wrote it is, I who speak to you, I am. And John, as we know, he's a poet. He loves these things. He has seven times Jesus making an I am statement with a predicate. So I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the true vine. I am the resurrection and the life, etc. Seven of those throughout the Gospel of John. But he also has seven absolute I am statements that are sometimes lost in your English translation, where he just calls himself I am. So before Abraham was, I am. And here he says, I who speak to you, I am. And this, of course, is the divine name, the name that God revealed to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus, the name that he revealed to his people. And in the book of Exodus, uh, this name is used seven times to speak of God. I am the Lord who heals you. I am the Lord, your banner, etc. I am the Lord, gracious, compassionate, abounding in anger. And this is God's revealed name. It's the name that evolves into this form that we have as Yahweh or Jehovah, which is the the first person of this verb carrying on i am that i am i am who i am and we say to god you are who you are and so jesus is revealing himself to this woman as god he's going back before her before the division happened between samaritans and jews he's going older than 700 years ago back to the creator back to the father back to the common humanity and back to god as the i am the originator of all life he revealed he entrusts this incredible revelation this is the first time he says it in john of seven he entrusts it to this woman he 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 sees her as someone worthy of such great revelation such freighted truth about god and so she goes she tells her whole community you know the end of the story and through her witness uh, many from that community come to faith so she goes and tells everyone and we read verse 41, many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. We've heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. And here this beloved phrase of our savior of the world is used for the first time about Jesus on the lips of Samaritans. You see, Jews couldn't call him the savior of the world because it is just an in, inner ethnic thing. But as soon as he's crossed into another community they can say he's actually the savior of the world it's like if you look at sport in america you know they call the 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 american football or the baseball they call it the world series but it's not really they're just playing other americans but jesus here has broken out of just a, a cultural isolation and so he truly has demonstrated himself to be the savior of the world and so just to summarize uh, as a way of ending and then we're going to go into uh, breakout rooms and have some time to discuss and reflect together. Jesus is searching for his bride and she is to include all nations, even the Samaritans and even the people with the history that is most opposed to your community's history. Even the people that you would have the most historic pain with. She's going to be part of the bride too. And the bride's not done until all communities are gathered in. The first thing she wants to talk about is inequality, pain, the brokenness of the world and how it affects her personally. And Jesus is happy to engage with this issue sensitively, wisely, indirectly. He doesn't say that's not important. Let me just tell you about life after death. He engages with it. And in engaging with this issue, 
he's also able to make this wonderful revelation about himself. To be prophetic is to engage with injustice, which is why she says, sir, I can see you are a prophet in her journey of understanding. And Jesus breaks the binary. Wisdom always creates a new option. Don't be forced into either or us or them, right or wrong. So often wisdom can open up something different that was unexpected. And Jesus has brought a new world that isn't centered on one place. And Christianity, it doesn't have a sacred city. It doesn't have a sacred language. It doesn't have a sacred culture. Christianity is expressed through the different cultures and the different languages and the different translations of the world. And actually, as Lamin Sane said, translatability is possibly the most important thing about Christianity. And Jesus is proved, therefore, to be the saviour of the world. Amen.